Amazon International number one bestseller, Jim Britt's Cracking the Rich Code, Volume 6, Time, by featured co-author Rhonda Grant, performed by Rhonda Grant. The moment you were born, someone noted the time, recorded your arrival, and acknowledged your existence. Time, day, and year matter astrologically because of where the planet sat at the moment you arrived. Apparently, this is what determines most of the events in your life. You were born somewhere along your evolutionary path, and you, just like the rest of us, are conditioned to acknowledge and adhere to the most important aspect of life, time. Time is everywhere, on your phone, computer, vehicle, and billboards. It reminds you if you're running late or exactly where you are meant to be at that moment. Time is so important, a whole industry was born of clocks and watches. Am I late, early, or on time? I need to know if I need to hurry up, be angry with people who will not hurry up, and even yell at those who will not move faster. People are waiting. What will they think if I'm late? I must be on time. It's Tuesday morning, September 11th, 2001, in New York City. With its hustle and bustle, people are getting their kids off to school and daycare. Some are trying to inhale their morning coffee. The person waiting in line at Starbucks watching the clock because the customer ahead of them cannot decide what type of coffee they want. Could this delay in a person's ordinary routine that seems common yet alters one's course and spares their life? When you consider time from this perspective and acknowledge the lives that were spared because they were running late, the power of the thought may give you pause. Sometimes the universe has a way of stalling you, putting obstacles in your way to slow you down. But many of us ignore these intuitive hits because we have a commitment which includes being somewhere at a specific time. How could anyone know they were rushing to their death? Perhaps they had a bad feeling, a voice from their unconscious, urging them to slow down. But it wasn't loud enough to prompt them to slow down so that they could avoid the unknown disaster looming ahead. I remember speaking with a man who had the same last name as my mother's maiden name. He was a manager in a cheese factory. For some reason, we started talking like we were old friends, and he told me that because his great-grandfather was running late, he missed boarding the Titanic. The strangest feeling came over me at that moment, because the head time worked differently on that fateful day. The man before me may not have been born. A whole family line never would have existed, and no one would know it was missing. I often wondered if those who heed their inner voice and slow down or make a different decision are sometimes spared harm. Time has given us our history, which we have turned into a story based on our own interpretations of the tales told to us and the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Sometimes, when we reflect on specific moments in our path, we find we're still gripped with the pain from what we experienced or from our own transgressions against others. Time cannot change that. We need to gather our own bravery to address our issues and allow ourselves time to heal those parts of us that need nurturing. But there are those of us who do not have the courage to face the pain again, even if it is to heal. We carry it with us instead, letting it infringe on our time with others. It shows up in our conversations when we hear not what is said, but rather how we interpret from others' words. Meanwhile, we feel as if we are in control of our lives, that we've got this. Yet, we are out of control because we do not have a crystal ball to know what comes next. Consider the wake-up call we received when the pandemic arrived and a lockdown was declared. It seemed as if overnight our world completely changed. We shift our vision of time and what it meant. How long will it last? Will my company survive? Will I have a job when this is over? Workplaces, daycare, schools, clubs, fitness, sports activities, and restaurants all closed. Other places like seniors' homes locked down because of the high number of COVID-19 cases and deaths. Our roads and streets became eerily quiet. What would the fallout be because of it? Our time was compartmentalized into days, weeks, and then months. We had to wait another week to see what our leaders would decide about when the economy could reopen. It would either be more time in isolation or returning to a new normal. 
Most people lived in fear because we were bombarded with media depicting what was going on in other countries. It seemed as if we were living in a Stephen King novel. Each day we listened to rising statistics about virus cases and deaths all over the world, and it was frightening. Many people reverted to the reptilian brain. Their survival gene kicked in. There were shortages at stores as people began to hoard food and supplies. Some bought baby chicks because they mature quickly and could produce eggs, creating ongoing food source for a family. Gun owners bought ammunition. The uncertainty of the pandemic affecting the food chain scared people, and they wanted to be able to hunt if need be. It was a way of tucking in and people setting up for the long haul. The lack of distractions, local and national sports, theaters, dinners, and in-person schools made us feel like we were living in heavily restricted ghost towns, villages, and cities. Some people did not fare well in isolation because they could not see their loved ones. Some were waiting on a surgery they needed and found that procedure was constantly booked, cancelled, and rebooked because hospitals were taking care of those stricken by the pandemic. It is interesting to observe that as time moved on, people became desensitized to the media's fearful language and predictions. When the second and third waves of the virus hit, people looked for hope instead. When would the vaccine be available? We learned quickly that making plans did not mean they were going to happen, because even though schools, restaurants, and businesses were open today, there was no certainty about tomorrow. What has the pandemic taught us about time? For many, we learn to reprioritize things. We learn to do without what we previously felt we could not live without. Time changes our perspective, and during a pandemic, we all worked at finding ways to speed it up. We hoped that the development of a vaccine would hurry up so we would feel safe, see our loved ones, and go to work again. We wanted to see our children back in school. We concerned ourselves with how this would affect them in the long run. When people stayed home, they learned to do business differently. They were forced into a different type of survival. They allowed more time for personal creativity because there was no longer a commute to work. The entrepreneurial spirit that had lain dormant within many rose, given light to a new excitement about the future and the possibilities therein. People who spent time in creative thought birthed books, poetry, and songs. Pictures were painted, gardens were planted, and animal husbandry began. People spent time meditating and began to get in touch with their inner selves. We never know when a regular checkup with a doctor may end with a series of tests and diagnoses that our days, weeks, and months are limited. Is there an opportunity to consider how we spend our time before we are told that our time here is limited? What happens when we do not take care of the things need tending? When we run out of time and the project is not completed, or when we choose not to address an issue that needs addressing, hoping it goes away. Time has a way of showing you just how big the little things can get by increasing the cost associated with unresolved issues. If you reflect on these situations and then go forward, show up and pay attention to what needs to be taken care of, time takes care of the rest. Perhaps not in a way you intended, but in a way that reflects the mindset from which you approach the situation. In that moment, you may curse and acknowledge the I should have, or you might simply not take responsibility at all. Other words for responsibility are action and attention. They speak to one's ability to take immediate action when it is possible to correct the situation. When you do not act, you have only yourself to reckon with and not time. Stop trying to negotiate with yourself and with time. Hold yourself in the highest esteem possible so that you can benefit from time. Mold it into what you want your reality to be. You are the creator of yourself and your circumstances. Believing otherwise is cheating yourself from your extraordinary potential and the possibilities that time affords you. You have been gifted this time so you can self-actualize. Self-actualizing your gifts will add joy into your journey. Sharing your gifts with others with the true essence of your being is where you need to invest your time. The gifts you have received in this lifetime are to be developed and then shared with others. The universe will bow down to the one who has aligned themselves with their walk, purpose, or mission. As you check in today, count how many times you acknowledge or refer to time. You can speed time up by doing things you love or slow time down by doing things you have to. 
Regardless of how you spend your time, the days, years, and decades of your life march on. You neglected to appreciate your youth by wishing time would pass quicker so that you could reap the benefits of being older. You then discovered you yearned for a time when you were younger. We wish our days will pass at lightning speed so we can get to where we want to be, only to then wish that time would slow down and allow us to enjoy the things we want to last forever. I encourage you to take the time to embrace the true essence of your inner being, appreciating the virtue of time and molding it into a beautiful space so that you may dwell in the spirit of love. Enjoy all the moments life offers you, not just some of them. How quickly the years and decades pass, making it hard to remember exactly what we did with our time. Did we simply spend it? If we spent it without thought, it owes us nothing. You might be saying to yourself, well, that's all well and good, but it's not your reality. I invite you to make a record of the activities that you are involved with for one day. A record of one day provides you with a window to see what you are doing with your time. Our brains trick us into believing we are maximizing our efforts and that there's no more room in a day to complete your task, but that isn't true. Grab a piece of paper, use a whiteboard, or develop an Excel spreadsheet and make a chart of your whole day at 15-minute intervals. Some things do not take longer than 15 minutes. Record everything you do. For things like self-care and sleeping, consider blocking those hours to ensure that time is accounted. Include leisure time, like watching a movie and scrolling through social media to get caught up with your friends. This is not an exercise to have you remove things you enjoy from your day, but rather an opportunity for you to gain a clear insight of the things you spend your time doing. Once you educate yourself on what you're doing, only then you can become the master of your time. Becoming the captain of your journey allows you to self-actualize your life. When you can assess yourself accurately by this exercise, you change how you see what you're doing and what you are emitting from your day. Most of us do not have the conscious awareness to realize our shortcomings. If we spend time in thought, contemplation, and revelation, we allow ourselves to self-actualize instead of running thoughtlessly after the next gadget, next promotion, next fix. When you align yourself with receiving gifts instead of subscribing to the hamster wheel that has you chasing after success, you create a happier and more fulfilled life. This allows success to enter the field of your awareness. You may cultivate your gifts from the essence of your being by looking inside yourself. Some may hold on to their reality at all costs, even at the expense of personal health, until something deeply and profoundly impacts the way they understand themselves. People often ask me, how do I have time to do the things that I do? I protect my time. I have things I need to do, and then I have things I want to do. I'm awake early in the morning, so instead of trying to find sleep for another hour or so, I get up and begin the things that I enjoy, the activities and tasks that help me align with the truth of myself and my gifts. I create, meditate, drink coffee, and go on long, brisk walks, all before the business day begins. That gives me time to enjoy my personal routine that prepares me for my daily business tasks, the must-do things. Take time and mold what you want to do, accomplish, and enjoy in your life. Take time to compartmentalize the things you want to do and then allow some time to do just that. If you're spending your life not liking what you are doing with your time, you need to address that truth. You must spend time figuring out why you're here and what you've come here to do. You do not want to spend the latter part of your life wishing and regretting anything. Everyone is different and each person's journey is unique to them. You simply need to get in touch with what your journey is meant to be. But we do not know the possible outcomes of our decisions, or do we? What about that part of us, those whispers that guide us, warn us that something good or bad is about to happen? We slough it off as we pay more attention to our egoic self, that part of us that we chat with occasionally. We must subscribe to time to make a living, to raise our children, and we cannot forget about time because if we do, we are left behind. Our children are evaluated by doctors for size and assessed by a chart. They are either on, behind, or ahead of where they need to be at that moment in their life and development. If you are not ready for a certain category of sports or a certain grade, you could develop an attitude which causes you to arrive that moment later than what was expected to you. 
When you hear others refer to you as average, you may live out a so-called average life. You may subscribe to a reality that you only need to put so much into life because you are, what they said, average. Embracing this mindset suppresses your talents and causes you surrender over your true potential. Many, however, have risen above their conditioned selves and succeeded despite the labels they were given. Some have fallen into a rhythm of a lifetime of working for one company until retirement. People talk about retiring at 60 so that they can do the things they've held off doing. They are doing time to get more time to do the things they love to do, want to do, have been waiting to do, remembering with each tick of the clock that time is marching on. Many people have heart attacks and die as soon as retirement comes. Why retire anyway? Why not continue to live your life to the fullest no matter what stage of life you are in? Time is attached to our hearts and our health. It keeps us from dying sometimes. It brings us joy and laughter or pain and suffering. Those who were late did not die during the bombing of 9-11, the sinking of the Titanic, or the many plane crashes. Instead, their lifelines were not interrupted. Their lineages exist today because they were late. They were too late for work, too late to board the ship, and too late to catch the plane where people perished. They survived. People whose blood pressure soared because they were late and were short with those they loved fell victim to the power that time held on them and their existence. Time of death was recorded, and yet, for the rest of us, Time marches on. We hope that you've enjoyed my chapter on time, produced by Ken Friesen at The Signal Path. For Rhonda Grant's suite of services, email her at rondagrantauthor at gmail.com. This audiobook is audio-powered by Simatracks.